All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Emily Voss. I'm the Director of Education at the Robert H. Smith Center for the Constitution at James Madison's Montpelier. And this evening we have kind of a combination book talk a little bit of Constitution 101, a little bit of something completely different. Um, we're very excited this week to be celebrating a whole series of programs that uh, all have to do with, in some way, shape, or form, celebrating James Madison's birthday, which is officially tomorrow. Um, but this evening, we are joined by Kim Whaley, who is a really amazing professor. Um, she is joining us. Uh, this evening. She's a, a lawyer, a former CBS news analyst. Um, she's produced commentary for CNN, MSNBC, BBC, NPR, lots of other media outlets. Um, we have at Montpelier, we've known her quite well for some time because uh, she's written two previous books, um, which have to do with various constitutional topics. Number one, how to read the Constitution and why. And then secondly, what you need to know about voting and why. And um, as we, we've learned through conversation, her previous work is, is informing her newest book, which is How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why. Um, and so you might think to yourself, wait, what does this have to do with the Constitution? But I assure you, it does, um, particularly when it comes to our ability to read and pay attention to particular nuance and detail. You know, that, that definitely comes into play when we understand the constitution, but also comes into play in our daily lives. So I am very excited to uh, welcome Kim Whaley with, with us this evening. Um, and for those of you who have not joined us for one of these programs in the past, we are happy to take your questions. We're going to leave lots of time for Q and A and feel free to, post your questions using either the Q&A feature or the chat feature, and we will get to your questions uh, toward the end of the program. All right, so Kim, please take it away. Tell us more about how to think like a lawyer and why. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation, and particularly on such an auspicious evening, that is uh, the night before James Madison's birthday party. And thank you for everyone who is signed up to come and that's in, in the audience today. Uh, really important topics and I just celebrate and laud the, the work that you do because we are in a moment um, where civic education is is in my view what could change the trajectory of our democracy um, it's that important it's important of course to have background information um, but right now it knowledge is power and power means protecting the democracy so you're absolutely right i'm going to get to my new book how to think like a lawyer and why um, but i want to start with a quote from our friend james madison who uh in a note opened after his death after his death in 1836 stated Quote, the advice nearest to my heart and deepest in my convictions is that the union of the states be cherished and perpetuated. And, you know, the third book is about how to do that. How do we perpetuate our union? But let me back up a little bit and talk how I got into this. So originally, um, I was under contract to write a, a book about, um, about, a scholarly topic relating to outsourcing in the Constitution. And then I started make doing commentary on uh, things that were happening in the news relating to the separation of powers and the structure of the Constitution, frankly, in the last presidency. And I realized, listen, I need to write a different book because there was so much misinformation, not even just around you know regular people, but even around commentators, um, uh, legal commentators, because you know, the Constitution is kind of a sleepy area of expertise. That is, um, you know, 10 years ago when I was when I was writing a, a law rev, a law school exam, I'd have to get very creative about ideas that could happen to our democracy that would seem far fetched. And we've now surpassed them all. Things that have happened in the last few years, I think, are beyond anyone's expectation. So book number one was Constitutional Literacy 101. And as you indicate, as Emily indicated, um, and I'll show you the book. The, the critical words here are read. That is that we have to learn how to strive for ambiguity and realize the Constitution is squishy. It's old. It has a lot of vague terms in there. And um, and just like a poem or a religious document, 
the, the Supreme Court has to judge what it means. All of the judges on the court, the justices judge. And so the suggestion we've gotten in the last few years that somehow only good judges uh, should be confirmed because good judges only read the plain language, that's a myth. Uh, it's inaccurate and it just doesn't make common sense because it's an old document. So that's number one. Then I got to the end of this book and, and realized that um, accountability for the Constitution, of course, it's not a document that's self-executing. It can't go to court on its own and file a lawsuit to protect itself. It can't go to the ballot box and elect uh, members of Congress and people in the White House that are going to respect it. The way that we make sure the Constitution has meaning is that we vote. And it, it really surprised me that there is no affirmative right to vote in the original constitution. There's no words that say every citizen shall have the right to vote. I think if that were in there, we would not be in the mess we are with voting rights across the country and a Supreme Court in this moment that really isn't all that dedicated to protecting the right to vote, frankly. And I'm happy to answer questions about that. I say that soberly and not politically. Got to the end of that book and I was like, wait, why do people not vote? And not only do they not vote, um, we're having a debate, a post-factual debate about whether the voting system is in America is even worth protecting, whether votes should be thrown out, whether we should allow politicians to decide elections and ignore voters. Uh, and I said to myself, wow, that's a deeper problem. That's a problem about communication, about um, sort of social psychology, which I'm not a social psychologist, but I was teaching a class a few years ago during the first Trump impeachment when I was a CBS news analyst and I was on air talking about um, talking about the constitution and then going to teach about the constitution in a class called Democracy at Risk and realized, whoa, this could turn into a very uncomfortable situation for the students. So I asked them on each of these very polarized topics to come to class having read two points of view somewhere from somewhere. Uh, and we talked about how to get good information that is reliable sources uh, op-eds, columns, but but come come sort of with two ideas, two different points of view. And at the end of the semester, they said it really was, uh, I did kind of a round table, about 30 students, it, they said it was just life changing or education changing for them and that they felt for the first time coming to class curious and not dug in on their point of view. And that they became very good about having a team, having an opinion, and defending that and when we when we're in that mindset we're not really open to competing points of view in fact we get defensive if people challenge us and that's where we are so that gets me to book number three i said wait a minute um there's a i think people think lawyers are about fighting for an, for a side sure but what you don't see when you're watching you know these tv programs is the weeks months sometimes years um of prep work that goes into get going down every rabbit hole, finding all the arguments, all the facts that are bad for you, seeing where the potholes are. You might have to go to your client and say, listen, I can't do what you want because the facts are just bad. Or if you've got bad facts, feeling at, figuring out a solution that works for your client, even if they came to you with ideas um, that you just cannot achieve through the legal process. And so that's, that's the, that is how to think like a lawyer and why. And it's really, um, sort of a chicken soup for the soul or Ted Lasso approach uh, to dealing with hard issues. And the hard issues can come from something as big as, you know, our political divides, you know, vaccine mandate versus no vaccine mandate, or do I get my kid vaccinated? Do I not get my kid vaccinated to, gosh, I'm in the midst of a, a messy potential divorce. I have a couple kids. I feel overwhelmed. There's so much. I don't know what to do. Uh, and people end up going to lawyers and it's very expensive. Um, but, but lawyers, lawyers, uh, are still in the mix in our society for a reason, because they know how to get through the bramble bush. They know how to, how to sort through a messy, uncertain situation. And the key re distinction between how to think like a lawyer and pretty much every first year student who comes into the door is that lawyers look for the questions. They don't look for the answers. Um, they look for the questions. Uh, and then they hash out the questions with as much, um, uh, as, as thoroughly as possible. And only then do they come to a conclusion and it might not be the conclusion their client wants. And so in my book, 
how to think like a lawyer and why I take the law school thinking like a lawyer, which is it's boot camp. It's really hard because you've got to rewire your brain and I break it down into five steps. And I call that the BICAT method, B-I-C-A-T. So B stands for break down the issue. I stands for identify your values and your aims. And that's really, really, really important. Uh, I think people think lawyers are just sharks, but actually no, the law is all about a value system, a shared value system. The constitution is a shared value system. C is collect knowledge, collect knowledge. And, you know, I did a lot of talking about the last election and, um, and, you know, I think it is significant that there were 60 plus lawsuits challenging the election that were thrown out. Why? Because in courts, information has to be verifiable. It has to be authentic or, or it'll get thrown out. And that was the problem among other things. So C is collect knowledge. A is analyze both sides. And I play this game trick or whatever, uh, you know, pedagogical methodology with my students where I'll give them a position. And then I'll, once they're convinced it's the right decision, I'll ask them to take the, to take the other side and I'll give them five minutes to talk about that. And it's really, really impactful because they were so sure their side that they originally assigned was the right side. And then when they have to represent the other side, they realize that the other side has really good arguments as well. And uh, we're not so good about that in our society anymore. Um, B, break it down. I identify your values and your aims. C, collect lots of knowledge. A, analyze both sides. And then T, T could actually be the beginning. Um, it could be T by cut. Uh, T is tolerate the fact that you might be conflicted and people will disagree with you. Um, this is really hard in our social media age. It's hard in our uh, what some people called can cancel culture society, which is something that crosses the political divide. It's on both poles. Um, and, uh, and you know, it, when people get ostracized or rejected, they feel shame and that's yucky. Um, and so then we get more dug into our decision and our position from day one, right? So, so if we understand from the beginning that might not turn out exactly how we want, I think we're more able to tolerate competing points of view maybe we're more able to tolerate an outcome that didn't seem like it was the right one for us in the beginning. But, but the reason, again, I go back to my bycat, the reason I have identify your values early is if you know what your values are, you can tolerate an outcome where you don't get everything you want. Because law like life is messy. Law like life is mostly gray. Um, the old fashioned make a pros and cons list, uh, we do that, but a lot, of, a lot of us don't know what to do with it once we've done it. If we sit down and do it, we don't know what to do with it. So I take that old fashioned pros and cons list, but number one, just understand it. You give stuff, stuff up. A hard decision means you're giving stuff up. Um, so if you can tolerate the fact that, okay, I'm not gonna, it's not a win. It's a loss to some degree. But it's a win if we identify our, our values early and our, the outcome is consistent with our values. So I'm going to use an example that I've been asked because I've been interviewed about the book a few times. And, um, and I was asked, well, can you talk about, you know, whether, you know, we're kind of out of it, knock on wood with Omicron being behind us, but do I get my child vaccinated? Okay, so that is a deeply polarized issue in, in our culture, one that people don't even want to talk about because it gets people so upset. You're either pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. And uh, how could you be that way if you're on one team? How could, it's a, It just shut down any discussion. Well, be in BICAT, break that down, okay? It's really, it's not, that's not the question. The question is what, what matters to you? You know, what the sub-issues, one might be medical, Right? So we talk about your child, they might have some kind of preconditions that, that are different. It could be affected by a vaccine or if they don't get a vaccine, one could be their educational status. Maybe they're, they really don't learn on Zoom very well. Your child doesn't learn on Zoom. So being in the classroom is important. Or maybe the other way around, um, they're better at home or you, that, that, what, so that's it. So we've got, now we've got two. The question of vaccines is now health, and education. And now we might add ideological views on what the government's role should be, which is where we started, black and white. 
that's there, right? But when we break it down into three, you realize if you go for an ideological view, you might have to compromise on health or education, right? But at least we've got three now. So now this big issue that was reactive in our limbic system, we, our amygdala was all upset one way or the other, and we've put it into three components, all of which bear on that bigger issue. That's B. I then is identify your value system, and I have it in the book. I've got worksheets, and I suggest you identify what's your values. Maybe it is the health of your children. Maybe it is education. Whatever it is, it could be honesty, hard work, um, you know, uh, integrity, uh, humility, whatever it is based on the decision. Okay, I mean, and this is like say you're having a, a debate with a friend about something important. I don't know. I mean, the values can can range the gamut depending on the issue, but you've identified your values and then you might want to rank them or circle the one that's the most important. Well, in my, in my hypothetical, maybe it is health. Maybe it's health. I don't know, but for you and your family, for your child, we went from, are you pro or against vaccines to, okay, we have some issues and we've got value systems that are personal to me that I care about that have nothing to do with politicians. This is, this is mine and my family and how I was raised. My, my, maybe it's your faith. C, collect knowledge, collect knowledge around those issues, collect knowledge about the educational implications of being on Zoom if you won't vaccinate your child and you, and you need to have a vaccine to go to school, for example, or wear a mask. Uh, you know, knowledge about the health risks. I know we're debating that, but, but let me just say something about knowledge. We're debating it as a society, but I wanna say something about knowledge. I mean, I, I came of age in the 80s and 90s, and I'm one of five. I was raised in Buffalo, New York. And my mother um, would go to a supermarket called Super Duper. And actually I have a friend who was a teacher in Arlington who might be on the on this, so she knows a lot about this, a friend from Buffalo who might be in this conversation. But she, at every month, Super Duper, if you paid to spend another enough amount of money on groceries, you'd get another volume of their encyclopedia, the Super Duper Encyclopedia. So we didn't have the Britannica because that was like for, you know, that was fancy. But over how many months we got the Super Duper Encyclopedia, that's what we used to do our book reports. If we got really, gosh, I need more, we had to go to the library. Then we had to learn how to use the card catalog, write down the little code. If it was a big library, you'd have to then go and they'd have to go into the stacks and the books would come up. And if you wanted to go to original sources, you'd have to go to something called microfiche. You have to order the thing. You got to put it in the machine. And then you got to go through it to find it. And then if you wanted a photocopy, oh my goodness, you better have your coins. I mean, it was a whole thing. Finding the information. I did a, I did a, um, an honor thesis at Cornell and I spent a lot of time with the little three by five cards and the microfiche. Um, finding the information was the skill and we learned that really well. Now it's overwhelming amounts of information. The new skill is sorting it. And we don't know how to do it yet. We as adults know how to do it and we don't know how to teach our kids. Oh, Ray had a super duper in Erie, Pennsylvania as well. Um, we don't know how to teach our kids. It's a new skill. And the it's not just information. There's a lot of bad information. I can talk about this because something called the Fairness Doctrine was sunsetted in 1986, um, a, a statute where Congress required media outlets to give competing points of view that went away in the 80s. And now we've got all this very ideological misinformation on the airwaves. In addition, we have algorithms that look at our clicks and our swipes and think, oh, Kim believes this already. So I'm going to feed her a lot of that that just that just feeds on her confirmation bias. She's not going to hear competing points of view because I'm feeding it into your to our phone. When I was a kid, it was the Buffalo News. We all read the same thing. Or maybe you get the New York Times or maybe you turn on 60 Minutes. We all got the same amount of information and then we would sort that. Now we don't even get the same amount. So C, collect a lot of information, is we need to learn how to sort, not even collect, it should be sort, but sort. And I have some tips in the book. Number one is learn how to determine if the source is reliable. Number two is read original sources. That's a great thing about the digital age. We can click on the hyperlink and read it for ourselves, right? Read the indictment, read the bill from Congress, 
you know, read the speech, read the op-ed that got people upset, watch the video that people think was offensive, and then have an opinion. Um, so vaccines, you're going to de develop your, your, um, your, collect your knowledge, and then A, you're going to argue both sides. Um, lawyers have to do that or they will lose because you'll stand up in court, you'll only think of your side, and then the other side's going to throw some stuff at you and you'll be caught flat-footed and won't know how to respond. There's my friend Mary Lou. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Lou. You won't know how to respond. So, you, so lawyers have to turn over. They've got to understand their opposing counsel's case as well as their own. Not because they're better, you know, sort of more analytical, or I should say more neutral people than the rest of us, but because they're going to lose. So they have to, right? They're trained to do that. And then T, okay, so say you do your analysis and you decide, listen, I'm ideologically really opposed to vaccines, but my child is not doing well at home on Zoom. So that's T. So you might get your kid vaccinated. Because when you go back to your value system, that was number one. So you might make people in your family unhappy that you did chose to have the vaccine. But you can say, listen, I, I get it. I get that you disagree, but I don't need you to agree with me to feel good about my decision because my decision is consistent with my own value system. And that's a very different way of making decisions. The book breaks down decisions. I go through the bycat. Each step has a different a different scenario. Um, so, you know, it could be healthcare decisions, it could be family life decisions, a divorce, for example, it could be um, work environment, that's one of them. I introduce that step with a case taken from a law school class that I teach. So I take a case and so for B, we'll break down what seems like one big issue into the sub issues. And then I do it in an example for your regular life. So it is a bit of a, a sort of intro to law school in that the same sense of, okay, a first year law student will read something. They don't know where to begin. They don't know how to make any sense of it. And what we do is we teach them how to take that case and break it down into issues and sub issues. And that takes a long time. I did a, a book talk at my law school and it was last week and I had a former student come in um, and she was on the panel and she's now a practicing lawyer. And I had her for first year and she said, Oh my gosh, I read the book. It was it was like a flashback to first year with Professor Whaley. But she said that B is the thing she does. She gets clients, they come in, and the first thing she does is take their big question and break it down into smaller pieces. Not only does that produce a better result, but I think then we feel less overwhelmed, right? We can take it in chunks. And then it doesn't feel Woo, I'm over overloaded. I want to talk a little bit about brain research too before I start taking questions. And I talk about this in the book. That I, you know, there's a lot of knowledge, and there are probably people in this in this audience that know more than I do about, about decision making research, but um, there's a lot of learning about it. And if you've ever been in a situation where, you know, you had to make a quick decision, right? You're driving. I have an example in the book where I was driving from DC to Baltimore and the car in front of me on I-95 stopped in the middle of I-95. And in the amount of time, shorter amount of time that it would have taken to look this way, either way, my brain said, I need to merge into the right or the left. I'm more comfortable merging into the right than the left. So I'm just going to give it a shot. And I got lucky Then there was no one right there, but I did not have time to even look in my side view mirrors. That's my amygdala right? That's the, that's the fight or flight part of my brain that floods us with hormones. And we can, that, I mean, that calculus was like a split second. I went through all of those steps, those analytical steps. Of course, when I made it, I just burst into tears because the adrenaline was overwhelming. And studies show it takes 20 to 30 minutes for that, for the hormones to leave your body. This is why if you're ever in a, you know, in a debate or an argument with a partner or mom or whatever, uh, and it's escalating, take a walk for 20 to 30 minutes and come back. It's also why people who want to close a deal on a sale, say you're walking through a market in a foreign country, they don't want you walking away because you're excited. It's the same hormones. You're going to make a decision in that moment that if you walk away in 20, 30 minutes, you're like, gosh, I'm glad I didn't do that because you're more at an equilibrium stage. And when it comes to big decisions in our lives, um, we often go right into fight or flight because they're important. 
And then we don't know where to go from there. So one of the suggestions I have in the book is just wait 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, take a work situation. You're, you get a triggering email, do not press send, wait 20 to 30 minutes if you can. Then decide if to press send because your brain literally isn't on drugs um, in making that decision. But for the bigger, I mean, this is a good thing that our brains have done this. This has kept the human species sur alive and uh, survived, but surviving. But um, but for the bigger decisions, what I offer is a framework, a methodology for bringing order to the chaos, a methodology for dealing with deeply uncertain circumstances in life. And frankly, back to Madison, I mean, we are there right now when it comes to our democracy and, our, and the constitution. Constitution is not self-executing. That is, it doesn't grow arms and legs and go to court and enforce itself. We have to do it at the ballot box. And we're so polarized, we're in fight or flight when it comes to these issues. Um, we're being manipulated by bad information, by confirmation bias. Uh, and we are in this moment where if we don't save it, we're gonna lose it. And I'm not the only person who has said we are one presidential election cycle away from the end of American democracy. And I can talk about that, but I believe it. One presidential election cycle away. Um, and I, I don't, people say vote, 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 vote. But the reason I wrote the, wrote the book is that it's deeper than that. Um, just giving that message isn't gonna cut through all of this polarized, you know, not we the people, you know, we the Democrats, we the Republicans, we the politicians, we the powerful. I mean, we're in such a polarized win lose, black, white, us versus them. Telling people to vote is not going to do it. Um, we need to start conversations that where we connect with each other's humanity and our logic and our common sense. And I want to go back to Ted Lasso and I apologize for my dog if you can hear them <laughs> barking in the background. Um, that's one of the, the downsides in addition to not meeting you face to face of, of not having uh, with COVID keeping us apart. Um, but Ted Lasso, if any of you watched it, I mean, he's somebody that tolerates different points of view. He doesn't alienate people because they come to the table uh, angry or they come to the table with strong feelings or they they push against things that he matters to him, right? He he does buy cat, right? He I, he leads by his values. He tries to collect knowledge. He tries to look at the other sides um, of of other points of view. He tolerates that it's not going to always be perfect, and and Americans, I have have obviously celebrated that show. It's a it's a it's an unbelievable success, and I believe it's because. That's what we want. We want Ted Lasso. We don't want fighting. We don't want polarization. We don't want shame. We don't want canceling. We don't want, we don't want that. There is a common thread. And so back to democracy, um, as Emily so aptly and eloquently described, this book is about that. So if you want to know, you know, what can you do? Model for yourselves, model for your students, you know. Uh, and I tell my students, I don't want the conclusion. Most of us are not going to be on the United States Supreme Court making the deci final decision. So their their reaction is to go right to what's the answer? No, no, no. I don't. We're not going to talk about that. We're going. I don't even want to hear it on an exam. We're going to break down these. We're going to break it down. We're going to identify the values that that go behind the law, the why behind the law. We're going to identify if the information is, is valid that, that bears on this question. We're gonna analyze both sides and we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of the outcome. And if we can start doing this, teaching our children, modeling in our lives, maybe we can get start to get out um, of this black and white team mentality that is so corrosive to our democracy and our constitution. So with that, um, if we have questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, well, and I'm happy to kick things off with questions, but then of course we're we're always eager to hear from everyone else. Um, so the question, you know, I, that got me thinking was, you know, we often will find ourselves now, just over the course of conversation. You know, you're in conversation with someone when, and then you, you know, agree, you realize, you know, I'm. I really don't agree with this person's position on, you know, maybe it's vaccines, maybe it's, you know, some community issue, maybe it's some other, you know, deeply, you know, family or personal decision the other person is making. 
So kind of, is there a way that you can use the conversation and kind of to tease out where, where is this person coming from? Can I understand what their value system is so that I get a better sense of like why they're making these decisions? Because you know, sometimes I feel like the, the sort of gut response is, well, you know, where did you hear that? And then, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere. But is there a way that you can kind of tease out that sort of value-based humanity that you can then have a, a better respect? Yeah, well, you know, absolutely. And I think you're right. Where did you see that? That's a, that is, I mean, that that's reaction. We all are reactive. It's completely understandable but that's gonna trigger a defensive defense mechanism and a shame response. And people don't like shame. They wanna run away from shame, meaning they're gonna run away from you and you're not gonna get into any point where you can actually communicate. Um, you know, I, I, I get this a lot when I do like C-SPAN for example, and there's Democrat, Republican line. And what I try to do is first identify something in what they said that I can agree with. Well, it makes a lot of sense and I agree with that it really matters that we hold politicians accountable. Um, now, maybe they attacked Hillary Clinton, maybe they attacked Donald Trump, um, but that's something we can all agree with. And then why, why do we need to do that? You can talk about your regular life. So the bycat, you could go right to I, right? The identifying your values. The other thing you could do is break things down. Well, what do you think about this part about it? So you're walking away from the big overarching polarized question that that is too complicated um, to answer with yes or no, but that's why people are answering it with that yes or no, because, because you have to have a position and you're taking a piece of it, a chunk of it. And I find that once you're in a rapport with someone around some shared value, the canceling is harder to do on either side because you're starting from a place of common ground. Um, but, you know, the thing to keep in mind is T and BICAT, you have to tolerate that you're not going to, you're not going to get the other person to agree with you 100% and say, oh, you know what, you're right. What was I thinking? That's never going to happen. So if you can tolerate that, that's not going to happen. And if you can say, okay, this was productive because we had shared values around something, A and, or I and BICAT, identify your values. Then you both can walk away feeling maybe a little more enlightened, maybe feeling a little more connection. And it's really the connection that is the core of humanity. I mean, we all, I, I, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm probably botching it, is, uh, is Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, who said something like, all human action is about, uh, the, about love or the lack of it. And I thought it was so true. Um, people want connection or they're feeling rejected and they're reacting to the rejection. And so this book, ironically, uh, I think it surprises people that lawyers really aren't about fighting. I mean, there's only, there's sometimes you end up in court, but lawyers are about problem solving. They're about, um, they're about finding a way through thicket of complex uh, circumstances where sometimes the facts are, are not good for your client and you've got to make the most of them kind of like that Ted Lasso does. So thanks for that question. <laughs> so, you know, I guess a, a follow-up then, um, you know, and really what I think what you're, you're letting us know is that you need to do the work, right? Because I think it's very easy in the current culture that you want to stake your position and you need like two reasons why. So you, you know, Google, maybe Google or look on Twitter or something and there you go. And we look no further. But I think what you're really challenging us to do is to actually like do the work and, and go look into it more fully. Um, you know, but there are some issues that can be particularly challenging, particularly uh, if you don't have um, like a legal or a constitutional background. So I'm thinking in particular Supreme Court cases, right? So we might get two sentences on the news that, you know, a decision is coming down or, you know, the, the arguments have been made in this particular case. But, you know, in order, you know, for, for us to have a, an opinion, it would be best if we looked into the, the issues a little bit further, but that can be really hard. Um, yeah. So what do you recommend 
for folks to do in those cases where you know you're you're almost expected to have an informed opinion but you're not you don't feel like you're maybe quite there <laughs> well i mean i know this is some shameless self promotion but i i don't get i don't i don't get any uh when there are more downloads of my op-eds I, I don't you know it doesn't really benefit me but seriously i write about all that stuff so um you can follow me at kim whaley w-e-h-l-e -E. um you can read me the atlantic politico uh, i do a show called simple politics on youtube and instagram where i have experts and i, I apply the by cat in an interview i start from the basics i don't know anything about you know russian aggression can we what are what are the stakes so that's that's number one um uh number two just in terms of questions around the supreme court of course that's why i wrote this book is is because I think there's a myth. I've been told a lot when I have these conversations, um, generally from frankly older Americans, older people that say, oh, I keep my pocket constitution all the time. That's not that helpful um, because it's been interpreted for a couple hundred of hundred years and it's the interpretations that are where the proof is in the pudding. Um, I would just say a couple things that, that, that starting points. Number one is the idea that there's one way to read the Constitution is, is a myth. It's not true. So if anyone approaches a Supreme Court decision as if this is obviously the way to go, um, they're probably they're probably wrong on that premise. That is, if there's a 5-4 or 6-3 decision, there's usually good arguments on both sides. I'm going to put a pin in that. There were no good arguments for not upholding the Constitution, uh, the constitutional right to to, to um, to keep government out of decisions whether to carry a baby to term in the Texas case. Like there wasn't an argument to not uphold the existing law. And that's very that's a separate problem. That's that's a problem with the with the Supreme Court in this moment. Um, but generally, just like in my bycat, there are two sides to every to every story. So so I would say, you know, Emily, if you have the time and we should find the time, we used to go to get the card catalogs, try to read a couple opinions. And that's what I do in the morning. I get a bunch of newsletters. Um, I don't watch cable television almost ever, including when I'm on when I'm on it. And my clips after the fact. Um, I get a bunch of newsletters from sources that I respect. They're not necessarily all on one end of the political spectrum or the other. And I tend to read a couple of points of view on a Supreme Court decision, for example. And then you'll start to see some themes. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I think that's a way to start. And of course, I do think this is this is a book that should be, you know, in every high school classroom, every, you know, every everybody should read it because, you know, I don't know how to fix my car because I don't understand how it works. And how do we fix our democracy if we don't understand how it works? I mean, I, this is just to me, um, it should be handed out, you know, along with uh, along with your, the social security number when, when the baby's born in the hospital. <laughs> Maybe the social security com number comes in the mail. I also think you should get your voter registration card when you're, uh, when you're born in America. That's how it works in a lot of other democracies, but that's another topic. So I just wanna say for others in the, in the chat, I'm happy in this moment to answer any question about the constitution. I'm also a vote, a, a, an expert on voting rights and election systems, um, and as, and as well as pedagogical questions, that is, how do I teach this? How do I have a conversation with my kids about this? How do I, how do I grapple with whatever it is? All right, thank you. Well, I mean, I guess along those lines, um, we do have a question in the chat with regards to uh, maybe a point of clarification um, about the jurists of the Supreme Court. So I guess the, the point of clarification is, did you say earlier that we don't need the most qualified jurists for the Supreme Court, please explain. I don't recall saying yeah. that, so I'm gonna invite Ray, mm -hmm. if he does not mind to, to engage in, in a dialogue around that. So I obviously said something. Oh. Yep, and I may, need to, um, I may need to allow him to talk. Give me just a minute. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Ray. <laughs> You're welcome to, to talk and explain further if you like. If not, then that's okay too. Okay. <laughs> so, so no, I mean, uh, do we need qualified jurists on the Supreme Court? Absolutely. And um, I mean, I think they need to be lawyers. I think uh, they need to have a varied life experience. And I think it should be a diverse group of people. And, you know, um, 
it, it shouldn't be a political qualification, but it should be the qualification should be the same as as what we expect people in the ballot box, um, you know, when we're voting for politicians. And I really, really, really believe whoever we vote for, whoever we, we put on the Supreme Court should be someone who adheres to the rule of law, who wants the Constitution and the laws enforced, regardless of who they're being enforced against. And this is my problem with the decision in the Texas case mm -hmm. um, that the Supreme Court picked and cho chose a constitutional right that it just didn't think was worth enforcing. And that's not its job. Its job is to change the law if it doesn't like it. But the law of the land is 24 weeks, not six weeks. And we're seeing what's happening now across the country. I mean, the court didn't adhere to that part of the Constitution. So now people are just blatantly violating it. Idaho just passed a six week ban. And regardless of your views on the Constitution and the and the anti abortion, if you stop enforcing the Constitution, what will happen is what the framers understood um, they needed to avoid in running away from an unlimited mar mar monarchy in England. You're going to get the human nature to entrench abuse and abuse power that that'll kick in. And you know, if anybody thinks that okay, my rights are never going to be violated if if we just blow up the system. That's very naive, right? I mean, uh, that maybe today it's today, you know, it's it's maybe your rights are fine because it's your team that's in charge. But if you if you get rid of the rules and you get rid of the uh, the referee, um, when another team's in charge, you're the right. Your rights are the ones that are going to go. And what I say about rights, uh, and I talked about I've talked about this earlier in a, in a different uh, venue, but rights. All they are is an ability to go to court and get an order that then allows you to get a government entity like a police officer to enforce it. All a right is is the ability to go to court and enforce the Constitution. That's that's all it is. Um, but you talk about First Amendment rights. I mean, the rights that are at stake if democracy dies are the ability to speak, the ability to associate. There's no right to associate in the Constitution. People say, oh, Roe versus Wade is built on on nothing. Well, there's no right to associate. What does that mean? This conversation we're having right now, there's a right to assembly, but that's different from association who you get to be friends with. When you have government making those decisions for you or penalizing you because they don't, government doesn't like that Kim and Emily are friends. Then, then, and, and, you know, uh, People understand this, they think deeply about this. Then you start, you start thinking differently because you're worried about repercussions. So this is about as basic as it comes to your humanity, this concept of my ability to have my own opinions. If government gets to manage that, um, that's a very state, a scary state of affairs. And too many Americans just take it for granted that that'll never happen. And we're seeing it across the pond right now in Ukraine. Um, we're seeing it with bullets and, and machine guns, um, and we're seeing the population protect their democracy by, by putting their lives on the line, their children's lives on the line, and learning how to use military-grade weapons and, and going into the battlefield when last week they were planning their wedding. What do Americans have to do? We need to educate ourselves. We need to share that education, model it, and we need to vote. And you know, my call to everyone on, in this in this conversation is, you know, share a, one or two things you've learned today with one or two people and ask them to share it. That's how this stuff happens. And also, try to change your mind about something. We're we're so entrenched in our beliefs. It could be like whether you like pickles or not. I mean, it doesn't have to be some big thing. It doesn't have to be about vaccines. Um, but the older we get, you know. Uh, the harder it is for us to change our minds. Kids understand this and the teachers on the call, I'm sure understand this as well. Children are able to kind of be more, I mean, you know, it's just amazing how many times with my kids, they'll come back when they were little from the playground and have a whole day with someone. They've just became friends. They don't even know their name, let alone where they went to school. They don't care. They just meet them in that moment where they are. They don't have this sorting mechanism to put them on teams before they have a communication with them. They're also very brave. I mean, you know, this this is kind of the tea and by cat where you tolerate that you might not get everything. I mean, think about a toddler or a baby learning to walk. They keep falling, they keep falling and they get back on their feet and they keep falling and they get back on their feet. It's just incredible, right? Um, we're not willing to do that anymore, right? We want to just stay in our safe space with our safe people that believe what we already believe. 
Um, so hopefully the book will offer a pathway out of that for some people. That's such an interesting point because you know anyone who's spent time with with children over this the spectrum of growth is, you know, if, up to a certain point, they their opinions are definite. Like yes, vanilla ice cream is the superior ice cream. <laughs> it's a terrible example, but when they start to get maybe to like the middle school yeah. time period, and then you can start kind of pushing them to recognize gray area. And it's kind of fun to watch their brains explode a little bit, but you know they they kind of have this this whole new a uh, whole new way of seeing things is, is open to them. But um, you know they're not so much resistant to it as an adult might be. They're they're much more you know much more excited by the possibility of oh I never it's thought true. of it that way. <laughs> and mothers kind of some mothers were sort of uh, get nostalgic about the little, the young years going, but when they get older there, it's absolutely fascinating because they can think for themselves. But one thing, even with the young years, I mean, getting to this idea of finding common ground, getting to this concept of having autonomy and how it's important to, to you know, um, what I learned early with my kids is when they would get in that, I, I want vanilla ice cream, um, you know, chocolate is yucky or whatever. I mean, that, you know, the example I would use more like, okay, eat your vegetables. No, I, I don't want it. I want to have, you know, applesauce, which is sugary or whatever it is. I learned early on that, you know, I would give them two choices of, of vegetables instead of the one that was there, two options. And then I'd say, you, you choose between those two. Option three is not one of them. But if you don't choose between those, I'll pick for you. They want the autonomy. They want to be able to to exercise, they will pick one of the two vegetables every single time. <laughs> and I think that's that's a lesson to be learned about this black and white thinking. No one likes it. No one likes it. Everybody wants to be honored and respected as having a voice that, that matters and that deserves to be heard. And we need to re retrain ourselves to give space for that. And mm -hmm. again, the book is an attempt to do that. That's a really good segue into a question we got in Q&A. Um, so the question is, in writing your books, did you get any pushback, um, particularly when it came to editing? But yeah, what, what pushback have you received throughout the process? Great question. Um, editing, honestly, there was a whole chapter on agencies, federal agencies, um, which if you've ever heard of a regulation, uh, agencies are within the within the chain of command of the president, but they make laws, we call them regulations. So they're really, really important. There are more regulations than there are statutes. Um, and it's a very opaque area of the law. And frankly, I think this Supreme Court is probably going to at some point render part of regulations unconstitutional. So we're gonna see a massive deregulation of the economy. My editor's like, no, that's boring. She took it out. So there's that one thing. Um, the other thing that just really shocked me, and I'm going to pick on Buffalo again, or I mean, I love Buffalo, but I'm going to pick on Buffalo this time. I went to an all-girls non-religious high school, and I was invited to do a commencement speech the year that my book came out, and I was uninvited, ultimately, because the parents, some of the parents of the students thought that the book, this book, my friends, this book about the Constitution was too political and polarizing, and that they were not going to allow their daughters, it was an all girls school to walk the stage and accept the diploma if Kim Whaley was the commencement speaker. So I was uninvited. And that that's what, again, getting to book number three, that's when it really hit home. If the constitution is polarizing, <laughs> if the constitution is too political, we need to do some deeper surgery, right? Than just let's learn what's in it, what's in the document. So yeah, that, I guess that leads me to a question as well. So I mean, you know, obviously we find ourselves at a, a very polarized time, and you know, there's this this sense that you know, if if the people I voted for if they didn't win, then I'm just going to take my ball and go home. You know, whether that's you know sitting there and complaining on social media for the next two to four years, or in some cases uh, choosing to storm the United States Capitol. So. You know, how is it possible to kind of utilize utilize your method to attempt to overcome some of this extreme polarization um, in, in our societies? Yeah, so 
I think we can start conversations with one of the fa- any, I mean, I would say the B, the I, or the T in the mm-hmm. bycat, break something down into smaller pieces, mm-hmm. identify values, um, start with the idea that, listen, I might not get everything I want. I might, I might just have to, we say agree to disagree, but to me, that's kind of a hostile thing. Um, but have the goal be like some kind of shared value. What I, what I really, what really is um, disheartening to me is when young people, and I've talked to college campuses where they say, oh, it, the system's so rigged. If we don't throw the whole thing out and start over, there's no point in even voting because it's all so rigged. Um, my answer to that is, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but, you know, nothing plus nothing is nothing. So if you do nothing, I guarantee you nothing will change. Yeah. Um, so you got to you got to do something. And I feel like it's such a privilege and a gift, American democracy, having mm-hmm. liberties and freedoms. Um, so many people on the planet don't have it. And living in Washington, you know, you meet people from all over the world. And, um, you know, when I go down to to these networks to in a, you know, in a, in a car, they send a car for me to go down pre COVID, whatever. I, I, I meet a lot of people from all over the world and they've been just stunned that Americans don't understand and aren't willing to fight for this because they know what it's like to be in another part of the country. Many of these people or, or of the globe where you don't have basic privileges and freedoms. You don't have a free and fair press that you're getting fed. Look at what's happening in Russia. These, these mothers of these soldiers, think their their children are going to be met with open arms in Ukraine because Russian propaganda has fed them this lie that then you know Ukraine is is under some kind of Nazi control or they believe there's not even a war um that's not independence that's not liberty um I also wanted I, I was just took the liberty be a liberty of, of going back in the chat and I wanted to answer the first one of the other questions Sure. Someone mentioned, thank you for writing your books and talking about them. It seems that some, in quotes, things have been settled, that have been settled are now being turned on their heads. It's almost like settled things are, aren't settled and have come up as open to debate and change thoughts. If what the if what the question is, is about the Supreme Court, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of gets back to Ray's question. I think people who are not willing to adhere to the rule of law and color within the lines of their obligations and their prerogatives and their power under the constitution should not be on the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, we do have ideologues now on in the majority. And we, you know, it's very hard to amend the constitution formally. It has to take two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of all state legislatures. That's really hard. But when the Supreme Court interprets the constitution, reads an ambiguous squishy term, how to read, that's basically an amendment. Yeah. This court yeah. is going to massively rewrite, in my view, the Constitution. They're not doing it. They're on there without a mandate. The last three justices were put on o- over the objection of more than half the population, anyone who did not identify as Republican. Um, it's, it's, it's grotesquely undemocratic. They're there for life. I don't have an easy answer to how to fix that. I think it is perhaps the most corrosive problem in our democracy um, is is the fact that we have we have this ideological Supreme Court that is perfectly willing not only to rewrite the Constitution, but to rewrite laws. And they are not members of Congress. They are not accountable to the public. So let me give you an example, the Voting Rights Act, 1965. Um, with the help of Martin Luther King, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. Why? Because states were getting cute and outmaneuvering the amendments to the constitution, the civil war amendments that said, you can't discriminate in voting. You can't ban people from voting based on race. For example, women came 70 years later, um, but they then they would start to get euphemisms. Oh, you have to be able to count the bubbles in a bar of soap. Oh, you have to be able to recite the constitution when formerly enslaved people couldn't read. So Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court gutted the, a key provision in 2013 after multiple super majorities in, in, in the United States Congress wanted to include it, to, to, um, to continue the Voting Rights Act. And the provision they, they got rid of was called Section 5. It essentially said, you know, if you're gonna do some new law that really is cute, cute, maybe a way of keeping African-Americans from the ballot, you've got to run it by DOJ first if you are a bad actor state. Supreme Court gutted that. 
um, even though Congress liked it, supermajorities of Congress, that was inherently anti-democratic. This last year in a case called Branovich, um, litigants had to go to a different section called Section 2. A case under Section 2, which hadn't been used because there was Section 5 and DOJ was on, was on, was on the, the cop on the block. Um, the Supreme Court sent Congress back to the drawing board. That's the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that can't get past the, the Republican filibuster. So Congress has on pending, um, you know, can't get past the Republican filibuster, a fix exactly what the Supreme Court said to do. Basically, they said, you know what, you're using old data. We want you to just get new data. They did it. They have a new, not, won't willing to do it. So litigants have to use Section 2. It, in this last year, in an opinion authored by Justice Scalito, uh, Alito, he added five factors to Section 2. He acted as if he was a staffer on the Hill drafting the legislation and added a five-factor test for voters to satisfy to bring a claim. It is not in the statute. It's not his job to write laws. And the worst part about it is people think it's the conservatives that are somehow acting conservatively. They are radical, radical. That's Congress's job to write the laws and or agencies under the theory that Congress decided the agency can pass regulations um, and that has to be in a statute to give the agency that authority. Um, so to answer the attendees question, yes, this is a disaster. Mm -hmm. I do think Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts realizes this. Um, he is kind of, he's sided with the, I don't even call them progressives, I think the moderate constitutionalists um, that are in the minority now and uh, voted for voting rights when it came to gerrymandering in Alabama recently. Um, I also have my eye on Justice Kavanaugh as maybe at some point deciding to forge his own path I think that's possible knowing him as a, an independent thinker, even though he's a controversial figure. We just have to, we've got to hold together as like the people of Ukraine and send a message to the higher ups that we're not going to have this. We're, we're not going to fall for it. Um, and that, that goes for a person to person to stop this polarized thinking. So can I ask you, you know, perhaps what I think maybe our final question here. So, you know, voting is obviously, massively important um you know but there's always more that citizens can do um and you know i think it's important to to also consider you know what are what are our avenues of opportunity uh, above and beyond voting so um you know where do you think that that citizens can best put their you know put their opinion put their voice out there if or you know between perhaps between sessions of voting or perhaps if you find yourself in a district where the conclusion seems like it's foregone you know how can how can you really get your voice out there okay so i, I first do want to respond to patrick and arlene in the in oh, the sure. chat who took a took an issue with my suggesting that the supreme court decision was wrong yes it was wrong because um the con the, the supreme court is supposed to call balls and strikes an ambiguous language that's passed by Congress. So the job of Congress, and this I tell my students this, the job of Congress is to make laws. What's a law? A law is prospective, meaning it, hap it, pa it affects the future and everybody. It's generalized. So it's thou shalt not give stink eye on the metro, right? It's for everybody. That's a law. That's legislation. The Voting Rights Act is a law. Congress says thou shalt not discriminate in voting and has the criteria for that. Judges take that law and there'll be somebody that might have violated the law and there'll be a fight between Joe Schmendrick and Jane Doe about stuff that happened in the past and decide how to resolve that under the existing law. My problem with the Branovich case was the court, instead of doing that, added five steps to the prospectic thing that applies to a lot of people. Um, so anyway, that's that. As far as answering your question, Emily, great question. One is educate yourself. One is vote, 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 help others vote. I mean, I just got my, my mail-in ballot application for Montgomery County. I'll tell you, it took about 20 minutes to fill it out. Take the time to do that and run for office. 
Um, there are a lot of slots available. And I think what people don't understand, it's not just the Supreme Court and the presidency that matters. It's actually, you know, the local, like there are, low, there are offices for to run elections. There are offices, um, there are sheriffs that are on the ballots. So if you care about police, um, you know, uh, justice in policing, you can vote for in many places, justice, just, um, police, uh, sheriffs, you can vote for judges in a lot of places. If you want to have a certain kind of person on the bench, you can vote for that, or you can run for that. Um, so pay attention to the down ballot races, um, run for office. And I would say vote your values rather than your team. Um, that that's, and I'd like to end on that one. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Professor Whaley. I really appreciated your time this evening and your insights. Um, you know, for those of you who would like to learn more, and we always hope that you would like to learn more, um, Professor Whaley's three books, um, the newest one, How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why, plus the previous two, um, How to Read the Constitution and Why, and um, and everything you need to know about voting, basically, and why. Yes. <laughs> Those are all available um, at the Montpelier shop, among other fine retailers of books. So um, thank you so much again, and we will look forward to, to seeing your commentary and your, your insights going forward. So thank you. Thanks again so much, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for the great questions and the great chat. Have a good evening, everyone.